Hi, my name's Matt Godbolt, and I'm going to be talking about memories and caches. That is, how memory works, how it affects performance, and what we can do about it. So this talk is one I gave a few years ago at work. Some of the details are a little bit out of date, but in general, most of it is still valid today. I'm going to talk about the different types of memory, um, their characteristics. There will be some hairy hardware details, but I'm going to go very quickly over that, and it's not really important. It just gives you an appreciation as to why we're in the situation we find ourselves in. I will talk about caches and how they work. I'm going to talk about performance and how we can measure it and see how those caches um, interplay with um, data access patterns. We'll talk a little bit about virtual memory and then also how having multiple threads reading at the same memory affects performance. So let's talk about different types of RAM. So these are the physical types of RAM. The first type that we're going to talk about is static RAM. And then we'll talk about dynamic RAM. So static RAM is used in caches and dynamic RAM is used in the main memory uh, of your system. We'll also, uh, I'll mention now that there is other types of memory that is non-volatile memory. So like the ROM in your BIOS or the EEPROMs or EEPROMs in your embedded systems. And, and in, nowadays um, in terms of the floppy disk, sorry, floppy disk, the flash drives that are, are available. There is also flash RAM and Intel are coming out with even more clever ways of using flash RAM and making it faster. I'm not going to be going into those in this talk. Um, they have, again, even more different characteristics, performance characteristics, but um, I don't know enough about them to talk about them. So I'm going to stick to just talking about cache RAM and sort of main memory RAM that is static and dynamic. So this is what one bit of static RAM looks like. It's a lot of components. Um, we have an address line at the top, that red AL. And at the bottom right, we have the data coming out, the DL data line. And on the bottom left-hand side, we also have the not data line. These two are always complementary, just due to the construction of the chip, um, the construction of the cell, I should say. Um, the If there is a one being output on the DL, there will be a zero on the not DL and vice versa. And if you're interested in what the actual state of the memory is, you only need to look at the DL. So what does it mean to read from this one bit of static RAM? Well, the first thing is that we bring the address line that selects uniquely this cell, or of course, in the case of uh, many bits, as you would actually be reading, there would be a whole bank of these next to each other, all activated by the same address line. Then, as a result of that address line going high, these two transistors switch on and allow current from the middle part, that is the flip-flop, that's where we're actually storing the zeroness or the oneness of this one bit of static RAM. It allows the output from that to flow out of the data lines. And then you can look at those data lines and the data lines will be um, one on the right-hand side there in the DL if the bit was one and zero if not, and the opposite on the other side. So that's pretty straightforward. We enable the address line and then pretty much immediately give or take the time it takes the transistors to turn on, the output of that one bit of RAM is available for our the system to consume. How do we write back into this? Well, we pretty much reverse the process. Here, we need to drive the DL and not DL to the appropriate levels. So if we want to write a one bit in, we need to bring DL high and set DL low. And if we wanted to write a zero bit, we would do the opposite. Once that is, um, done, we then bring the address line high, and now those transistors are awake again, but we're pushing the current back, sort of back through the system into the flip-flops in the middle and then causing it to change state to be what the bit that we would like it to, to hold. Um, that only works because the drivers on the outside are more powerful than the drivers in the inside, the, the transistors that are inside, and that allows us to kind of force the bit into a particular um, state. So static RAM has six transistors for every bit. I've put them up there on the top right hand so you can kind of refer back to the diagram as we're talking. Uh, one thing I glossed over is that middle four block of, of transistors, uh, the flip-flop that stores the state, requires a constant power VDD. So that means that every time, even when we're not accessing this cell, it is taking up power. There's a certain amount of leakage that's going on. The output is at logic level, so these are ones and zeros. That is, if it's a 3.3 volt chip, those will be 3.3 volts or zero volts or whatever other internal voltages there are. They are discrete, they're definitely an all or nothing kind of thing, give or take the switching time of transistors. 
the design of it is pretty much um, uh, a repeating regular layout, which means that they can be laid out quite well on chips. Uh, and the access times are super, super fast. So why not make all RAM this way, you might ask. This is extremely quick. It's used in our caches. So why is my main memory so slow? Well, it's really, really expensive. All of those transistors do take up a lot more space than alternative methods. So let's have a look at what else we could do. So let's. this is one bit of dynamic RAM. Now you'll notice that there is pretty much nothing on the screen here. In fact, we've got a giant funny font right now because there's nothing to show. One bit of dynamic RAM is an address line and a capacitor. And the capacitor stores the oneness or the zeroness of this bit. So to, to read out the bit, we need to sample that capacitor. We turn the address line high, and that one transistor now connects the capacitor directly to the data line, and we can read it. And to write it, we just push the current or sync the current from the transistor to, uh, sorry, from the capacitor to either bring its power up to be a one bit or bring it down to zero to be a zero bit. So that's awesome. It's one transistor per bit and one capacitor per bit. It's even more regular and even easier to lay these out in hugely high dense um, arrays on RAM chips, which is why RAM chips are sort of separate from normal chips, although you can obviously embed them in them, um, and why they can be so high density. But we're now, we've moved from the logical domain that the uh, cache RAM, the static RAM was in, where it was a very discrete one or zero into an analog world where the result is not actually a zero or a one directly. It is some voltage somewhere between zero and one. And we know that that capacitor slowly leaks away its charge. So dynamic RAM, to sort of recap, one transistor and one capacitor per bit, it leaks charge, which means we need to do something about that. If we put a one bit in there and we leave it for a long time, by the time we come back and look at it, it may look like a zero bit. So we need to regularly top up the charge. And, and conversely, if it was a zero bit, then leakage from other areas of the chip might actually bring the capacitor's charge up. So occasionally we need to come back again and just make sure that if it's meant to be a zero bit, we discharge that out. The output of it is analog, so we need some way of making a decision about whether the voltage coming out of that uh, capacitor is one, one enough or zero enough, and make a, dis uh, a, a, a judgment to turn that into a logic zero or a logic one. And capacitors, as you can probably remember from, from um, high school, um, take a while to charge up, depending on the resistance and various other aspects of them. So that means that uh, we can no longer do this switching like the uh, the static cell did in one nanosecond. It's no longer as fast as that. It depends on a whole bunch of other physical characteristics about the chip. And so these are used in external uh, RAM chips. And because they're in external RAM chips, we have to minimize the number of feet that the chip has, the number of pins that plug into the board that you're going to be putting onto your computer. So there's two, and by minimize here, I'm saying like DDR3 here has 240 pins. That's still not enough to um, uniquely identify every single as part of the RAM. Um, so there needs to be some kind of compromise in terms of how we select and read out particular aspects of dynamic RAM. So here, for example, is a, um, a circuit diagram of an area of dynamic RAM. Here we have a whole bunch of RAM cells, and you can see how nicely regularly laid out they are. We've got a lot of um, capacitors and transistors that um, select those capacitors. And we have a bunch of them arranged in a, in a grid. And we can select, using some number of bits from the address, we can select um, one of the rows, which means a whole bunch of them will turn on at once. And then um, there will be a number of bits presented, depending on which, which row has been picked, to the RAS area at the bottom that you can see. This is where the row, row selector has come in, row address selector. Um, those are presented to this sense amplifier, which is effectively a, an analog to digital converter. That then goes into a set of latches. Now, those are much more like the flip-flops we saw in the static RAM. So you can think of the latch at the bottom as being a little bit like a single um, array of static RAM cells. 
So when we pick a particular area of memory that we're interested in, we select that area, those bits are sampled, put through a sense amplifier, this analog to digital converter, turned into logic ones and zeros, and then latched, held in regular static um, RAM cells. Then we can now, having selected this row, we can read within the row any amount of data that we might like from directly from those latches. And interestingly, it's not easy to see from this diagram, but the output from the latch is fed back into the RAM cells. So having now sensed these RAM cells as being either zero or one, and by sense these RAM cells, I mean this particular row that we've, 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 we've chosen, um, we now feed the current of ones back into the ones and we drain the current from the zeros back um, as we have interpreted them. So this is effectively tops up the ones and keeps the zeros drained out for that particular cell. So that kind of solves the refresh issue. So we know that, that due to charge leakage, there will be issues with some of um, the bits going away if we don't read them regularly. Now, what we all we need to do is select each row occasionally and feed them through the sense amplifier into the latch and then allow that one and zero, the pure one and zero, to feed back and either top up or drain each individual RAM cell. So provided um, we cycle through all of the addresses and banks of RAM um, one after another often enough, then uh, we can keep our RAM um, clean and we don't have to worry about um, ones becoming zeros, although there's an interesting set of bugs that have been found or rather misfeatures in the way that this is done and um, we can perhaps talk about that another time. Um, if, if you're interested, Google for row hammer and be very scared about what you might find. So let's talk about how we read DRAM. Now this is the extremely short version. So the first thing that needs to happen is that the bit lines need to be pre-charged. What does this mean? Well, we're about to directly connect those capacitors in the RAM cells to the sense amplifier. And if the sense amplifier was at zero volts and we were about to read a whole bunch of one bits, those one bits will discharge much quicker than if we had, for example, pre-charged the sense amplifier bits to somewhere between zero and one. And likewise, if they were all zero bits and we had charged everything up to one beforehand, we might inadvertently start charging up the zero bits to look more like one bit. So the pre-charge effectively puts like a somewhere 50% power line along um, all of the bit lines before we even allow them to be connected to the capacitors. And that takes a couple of memory cycles to get everything ready to do this sample. We then select the row, and now that means that the transistors um, for a whole row of um, bits are picked out at once, and that takes a few cycles. Then we're doing um, that read. We're allowing the, the, the data to flow from the capacitors down through the sense amplifier into the, um, uh, the latches at the bottom, the, the static RAM. The, and, and here in the particular um, example I was looking at, there's about 8,192 bits worth um, that are read at a time. Um, and as, as I was saying before, this is where the feedback starts recharging the cells as needed or draining the ones that are still zeros. Within that, we select a column, and that takes a couple of cycles, and that column is like a subset of those 8,000 bits. And um, now that data can be presented out um, on the bus and is available for the CPU to read. And then there is some kind of uh, row access time of before we can re-precharge so there's, there's some kind of extra delays here. And that's as if you've ever looked at a RAM chip and seen all the crazy numbers that are written on the side of it, then these all correspond to various parts of this cycle. And that's a quite a complicated sequence of events in order to just read out a certain amount of data. And you'll note that switching between uh, rows is a relatively costly thing, um, but switching between columns is, is not. Once we've picked a row, um, we can go backwards and forwards within columns. So this is... Um, usually not visible to the programmer. Um, normally the hardware is set up in a, in a way to make this um, um, as uh, invisible as possible. And memory controllers, which are like the bridge between the CPUs and the RAM chips themselves, are smart enough and have algorithms to, to reprioritize memory reads so that they take advantage of reading from the same row over and over again if, if it can be uh, kept open instead of having to close it and open the new row, jumping around randomly in memory.
So here's a little diagram sort of exam explaining how this might um, might happen. And the, the other aspect of these addresses that are being um, sent out, the column addresses and the row addresses, is that they are actually sent on the same physical wires. Um, and it depends on other wires as to how um, those are interpreted. And that, again, reduces the amount of um, pins that are re required on the RAM chips as we can effectively make the, the lines, the, the, the wires do double duty. So here, for example, the, the first thing we do is the column access select comes on, and that means that the address lines are interpreted as a column address that's, that's held down. And a couple of cycles later, the column has been picked. Um, and now we can pull data out. And data comes out in the next couple of cycles. Um, these are not to scale. Um, and then finally, um, we've got we pick a new row, and um, that means that the row access select line is brought low, and and so on. So this, it it really doesn't matter too much, but you can see that it's a lengthy, complicated state machine based system just to read memory from a RAM chip. Um, this all compares to the cache RAM, where it was pretty much a case of um, a single bit, uh, making sure the address line for that bit was was available, and we presume that in a cache. Um, the, the bits are able to be um, arranged so that the processor can get them without having to go through complicated um, column and row wise addressing although that's not not necessarily a given I don't actually know anyway so that's DRAM and you can see that that is much more complicated and, and more long-winded and essentially an analog component which was a surprise to me let's talk briefly about the memory controller I've already alluded to it a little bit uh, the memory controller used to be in a chip called the North Bridge. So it used to be the case that um, CPUs hung off a North Bridge, which is effectively a chip which um, allowed the CPUs to talk to memory and other very fast devices and also arbitrate for um, peripherals that um, were able also to talk directly to memory, DMAable peripherals. And then there would be a South Bridge, which does the slow peripheral stuff like the PCI bus and um, the SATA and like USB and other things like that. But the Northbridge has been brought onto CPUs, which has some implications for um, multiprocessor systems, which we can talk about later. So the memory controller knows how to open and close those rows, and it knows how to reorder loads and stores so that um, the best ad uh, advantage can be taken of the um, the fact that once you've opened a row, you want to like deal within that row itself. It is also responsible for scheduling the refreshes so that every 64 milliseconds at least, um, every single row is opened um, just to allow it to recharge and um, and not decay. And again, Google row hammer and you'll see how that you can, even with the 64 millisecond um, reschedule of, of refreshes, nasty things can happen. It also handles DMA, which is a way that um, peripherals can talk to the RAM chips directly themselves. So for example, your hard drive controller may wish to um, take data directly from your hard disk and put it in a particular place in memory and that can sort of route through the memory controller and um, certainly on x86 pr processors where there's a certain guarantees about how memory accesses can happen the memory controller is is able to have, to ensure that the uh, memory that is written to by DMA is is appropriately removed from caches or marked as invalid in caches on the CPUs so um, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes inside the memory controller so we didn't really talk about how the data comes out of the DRAM. So the memory bus runs at around about 200 megahertz. And you can forget all of the numbers that are written on the side of your RAM chips, that they're not actually running at that speed. So when you see like, you know, 14400 or whatever, um, or 1600, like the DDR3 example, lower down those pages, it's not really running at 1600 megahertz, despite what it says. Instead, um, the bus is pumped multiple times. So data is, is sent rather than every clock tick of 200 megahertz, it's sent twice every clock um, tick or four times or eight. So that's how, for example, DDR3 1600 can be a 200 megahertz bus sampled eight times within a single cycle using whatever, what hardware magic I don't understand, but it's, it's quite an impressive um, engineering feat. So each, um, each access is a 64-bit read, so the column select will pick out the 64 bits that um, we're interested in, and then we will receive them uh, at, uh, yeah, for DDR3, like the example says here, it's like 12.8 12 gigabytes a second. That's pretty fast. That's so every, every clock cycle, once we've done all of that crazy setup, every clock cycle, we can read out another 64 bits. That's pretty awesome. 
but it shows that the access time to the memory can actually dominate over the data rate. And if, if you're be able, able to stream through memory sequentially, you're going to get a much faster rate than if you're randomly at opening different rows and um, having to, to deal with all of the other refresh types, um, the RAS and the CAS and all those other times that we saw in the earlier slides. So getting the DRAM out is not that straightforward, but of course, we don't talk to DRAM directly very often. Oh yes, so there we are. Access times can dominate over data rates. And we don't talk to DRAM directly most of the time because in front of the memory is the cache. The idea behind caching is that the static RAM that we saw is small and expensive, but super fast. Dynamic RAM is cheap and large, but much slower. So why not use the static RAM as a cache for the slower DRAM? Cool, so we keep some static RAM close to the processor and it can hold some temporary um, copies of data that's in DRAM and buffer the processor from having to deal with this every time it needs to read and write to memory. But how do we do that in hardware? Well, the way we do it is to break areas of memory into little entries and each entry can be cached independently and those entries are called cache lines. So a cache line is 64 bytes of memory aligned on a 64 byte boundary. That corresponds to the bottom six bits of the address that the processor has generated. And the way that these caches are organized is that some number of bits is taken from the address to pick a set. That set maps into a slice effectively of the cache. Within that set, there are different ways, and there are the ways uh, correspond to the number of entries of the same set that can occupy that part of the cache. So here, for example, we're looking at um, a uh, five-bit um, set for like the level one cache. That gives us um, 32 sets of 64 bytes. So the the six bits at the bottom tell me where we are within the cache line. For L1, for example, we're going to pick the next five bits from bits six through uh, bits 11, and that will pick which of the ways in the L1 that we're going to be looking at. And then the remaining bits are a tag. That tag allows us to discriminate when we look at the ways that we've just selected, which, if any of those ways, contain the data that we're interested in. So how do we find a cache entry? Well, we first of all find out the set. Um, here are the number of ways, for example, I, I, I didn't mention that in the previous slide. That, like, so le the level one cache on the system is eight way, level two is also eight way, and level three is 12 or 16. It depends on your processor at that point. And we're talking here about Intel chips. As I said, the remaining bits after we've done all of this set finding are used as a tag. So, but why is that? Well, this is a kind of a block diagram of a four way cache and um, you can see that we have an address at the top there the tag a set and an offset the first thing that's going to happen is that the set is going to be fed into both the tag data sorry the tag array and the data array and there's a mux there which picks one of the ways so that set is picking sorry i apologize one of the sets that set picks one of the sets the columns in the tag and the data area there correspond to sets and then the four from top to bottom correspond to the ways. So our set immediately selects exactly one of the tag columns and exactly one of the data columns. We're going to say it's this one here. Now I've drawn it over the um, third tag the and th there isn't an equivalent on the data side but it, if, it would be the penultimate one on the data side too. So on our tag um, area we just have the tags. This is the tags that tell us what data is present in that particular way. The data from the tags is fed into a bunch of comparators. There is one comp comparator per way and the tag is also passed down from the top to those comparators. So each of those comparators is given the 50 odd bits of the tag plus the 50 odd bits of the uh, tag from the address. So we've got the tags from the cache and the tags from the address itself and the comparators will compare them and output a one bit if they exactly match and a zero bit if they don't match. So in this particular instance, 
Oh, there they are coming down. That's the tag coming into the other side of the comparator. And if one of them has a one bit, it will emit a one bit. And now along that yellow path to the uh, output array, we will select the data that was inside the equivalent way. Now, comparators are pretty expensive areas of, of, of chip. Um, they require loads of bits for the input and loads of bits, well, sorry, loads of bits for each of the inputs. Um, as I said, for like a level one, we're talking uh, 50 odd bits of comparisons. So that's why the number of ways is small. In an ideal situation, we wouldn't have any ways at all, and we could actually just put arbitrary data in the cache, and then we could compare all of the uh, cache lines uh, at the same time. But this has to be extremely quick, and the amount of chip real estate and routing required to get the 50 bits to, say, 1024 or 4096 different uh, cache lines would just be uh, impossible within the tiny amount of times we've got here. Now, on a modern x86 processor, this process is of one or two cycles. And so we're talking around about a third of a nanosecond, which is an insanely small amount of time. We haven't got time to get that amount of data to too many places. So we can't give it to the whole cache. The set brings it down to a manageable, manageable number of comparisons that can be done simultaneously. So in this example, the third way contained the data we were interested in, and as a result, the third mux comes on and the data comes out, the corresponding data comes out. So just to give you a little idea about what um, what kind of orders of magnitude we're talking about here. So these are this is for Sandy Bridge, which is you know fairly old now. The level one is 32k and takes around about three cycles. Level two is 256 and takes about eight cycles. And the level three, somewhere between 10 and 20 megabytes, depending on, on CPU. And that's around about 35 um, cycles. As a comparison, main memory is around 200 to 250 cycles, which is crazy. And of course, the variability in main memory depends on all the things we spoke about earlier. That is the whether it's the right row is available, whether or not there's contention, whether or not there's um, other devices talking on the bus at the same time and the DMAs are going on. So it's really important that the cache is there. And the cache is organized in layers mainly because, again, um, being able to, to route the data around um, the chip. Uh, let me start again. Getting data around the chip itself is, is tricky enough. So the fact that the 10 or 20 megabytes of level three cache is physically separated from the CPU um, on the chip. It's on the same chip, but it's just further away from the processing logic, means that you need a bit longer to go away and fetch it and for the results to come back. We're talking about like the speed of light level problems of getting data around the chip. So the, the level one will be literally nestled around the chip. Level two will be a little bit further away. And then the level three is, um, still further away and indeed shared amongst the many processes on one chip whereas the level one and level two are um, are per cpu core so then you, now we're going to talk about some real world ma real world measurements so this was measured on a westmere which was my desktop pc at the time a few years ago um, the, the cache size on this was 32k level one 256k level two and 12 meg of level three and Sandy Bridge, I'm sure, will be about the same. I put hope for similar timings here. I've been doing similar um, investigations since, and I haven't noticed anything that would lead me to believe that they are very different. We're going to time the cost per access of pointer chasing. So I'm going to make allocate a large area of memory, and then I'm going to fill it through up with structures which have a pointer to the next element in the in a in some sequence. And then we can, we can vary things like the size of each element the number of those elements, the total working size, and then where the next link points to. This means that it, within the loop of pointer chasing that we're going to do, um, we don't have to do any computation. Um, I can link them like this diagram is showing like um, sequentially so that each node points to the node that is physically next to it in memory. Or I can randomize the, the pointers and then have essentially random order of reading, but I don't have to have like a random routine that's running. Um, so I can just measure uh, the, the pointer chasing. And then depending on how I set it up, I can see different access patterns and different element sizes and working sizes. So this first example, 
I've got 16 byte structures and each one points to the next and I'm just reading from it. And then this is the log of the working set size at the bottom. And you can see that it takes somewhere between three and a half and four cycles. Um, obviously th there should be error bars on this, they're quite wide, but it, hopefully it's in, in indicative enough of what's going on that you can sort of follow along. And here you can see that um, as the log two of the working set size goes up, we see it start to pick up around 17, 16, 17. So at uh, log two um, size 16, we're talking 64K. Um, we know that the level one, if we just go back over here, level one is 32K. So it's surprising that we've managed to get to 64K, but apparently um, we uh, there's something else going on. But it, this is the point where um, the, the performance starts to degrade, but it's not by very much. You know, we're still talking like the difference between 3.7 uh, cycles and four and a bit cycles. And then really the interesting things start happening about bit 23. So at bit 23, uh, sorry, log two of 23, we have, what's that? That is eight meg of uh, working set. And again, going back over here, eight meg is not the 12 meg of our L3, but interestingly, we're starting to run out of L3 nonetheless. But the, the algorithms are not perfect. Um, there is some other things going on behind the scenes, which we'll talk about in a second. But you can see that the degradation drops pretty much sharply between um, 23 and 26. And then by the time we get to 26, we are at the worst performance. But it's still not bad. We're still talking only a factor of, uh, you know, two times slower than, than when we were in L1. So something else is going on. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, if we change the size of the, the the elements that we're reading, then it's pretty much the same story. Um, ultimately, um, if we start looking at like 8,192 byte strides, that's the lower red line, you can see that we never really get up to, um, uh, sorry, the upper red line, I'm so, I'm sorry. Um, you can see that it's much, it, we, we now hit like 250 um, cycles per, per read when we're at the, the bigger working set size. Um, interestingly, at the lower end, when we're, we're running around in like L1 and L2, it really doesn't matter how big we're jumping around. Um, but um, once we start getting to these bigger bigger block sizes, we're now starting to see something of the order of 250 cycles per um, read, which is around about what we would expect for RAM. So at that point, the caches are not able to help us. So. I spoke about how come the sequential reads for the small 16 byte um, elements didn't bottom out. We, we, we slowed down to about two X, um, the sorry, half the speed or twice the time taken when, um, when we started getting beyond the L1 and L2, but it didn't really bottom out more than that. And that's because the processor is smart enough to notice that we are reading memory sequentially beyond the cache size. That allows it to start prefetching memory. Areas of the cache will be allocated and RAM that we haven't yet asked for will be pulled into cache ahead of the time of us asking it. The way that this works is that if the processor notices a cache miss on the same instruction, it starts to infer a stride that that particular instruction is generating. So for example, if you go every 4k on the same instruction over and over again the processor will learn that, that that instruction is going to be reading 4k every single time uh, 4k on from the last time and then it can schedule a prefetch operation to happen behind the scenes so that it's already fetched into l3 and l2 before you've even got there or so you hope obviously if we look at this diagram here there is some kind of shelf where the prefetcher can't keep up when we're going, say, 8192 bytes or even 4096 bytes or 20486 bytes at a time. So, so there is something there which means that the, the prefetcher is not able to um, hide the RAM latency completely from us. But at the 8192-byte stride, um, why is that able, seemingly, to do better for longer? So if we now draw our attention to that red line, the top slower red line, although eventually it coincides with that 4096 green line at the uh, 250 cycles um, at log two of 26, you'll notice it actually does slightly better between 22 and 24. Why might that be? Well, the L3 cache on this particular machine is a 12 way, 12 meg cache. And the way that that's broken down 
means that the 8,000 byte stride that we're doing doesn't divide neatly into its um, uh, into the sets. So with 1024, 2046, two, excuse me, 1024, 2048, and 4096, that divides into the 12,288 um, set associative. So we keep landing in the same set over and over again. That means that we're forever kicking out data that was useful to us before. But 8192 does not divide neatly into 12288, so we actually get a bit more breathing room. That means that we're getting to use two different sets for our um, data, and effectively get twice as much um, space in the cache. But that's very, very specific to this particular architecture. It's also worth saying that as we are going up in the strides here, we are starting to use fewer and fewer of the sets that are available to us because um, if you imagine like our L1 where we saw that the bits 6 through 11 determine which set we're in, by the time we're skipping forward you know, 1,024 bytes at a time, the bits 5 through 11 are going to be the same for every cache line we're reading, which means that instead of using the entirety of the L1, we're now using a very small subset, that is the eight ways of the one set that we keep landing in over and over again. So it's very, very common for programmers to make things a multiple of powers of two because it makes a lot of sense both for addressing and address calculation and just because, well, programmers like powers of two, but there are times when you are reducing the number of sets of the cache that you are able to use because you keep landing in the same set over and over again. So it's just something to bear in mind. Hopefully that explains a little bit about what's going on with this particular example. So now let's have a look at the difference between uh, sequential reads and random reads. So here we are, um, well, we've got log two element size of six, which is what, 32, um, oh, sorry, 64. So we're looking at 64, so we're going cache line by cache line here. And we've set the same, um, uh, we're comparing this like with like here, except that in one case, the pointers between each block point to the next block, that is the blue line there, sequential reads. And in another case, we've completely randomized, before we started timing the program, we've completely randomized the sequence in which the pointers point. So you can see that for lower values of the working set size, it really doesn't matter whether we're in uh, order or in random order. They're coincident right up until 17, two to the 17 there. And that's because we're inside the cache. And there in the cache, it doesn't cost us anything to go um, around randomly inside the cache. And then once we start getting outside of the cache sizes, now the prefetcher kicks in and provided it can find a decent amount to be prefetching and a decent sequence to be prefetching, then we see the sort of slow drop off, um, but ultimately we're still talking only a few cycles for each memory access. The, the prefetcher is able to keep up with our, our uh, workload and our workload is completely predictable. But for the random case, the prefetcher is probably hurting us. It may be inferring that there is some kind of stream of data that it's, that's there that doesn't exist. It's completely random. And so we're not taking advantage of the cache at all. And we're, we're, we're seeing that the L1, we're missing the L1 and go straight to L2. So we can see it's taking us, or, L, or L3. So now we're, now we're hitting like um, 50 cycles of the L3 latency. Um, and the prefetcher is probably evicting lines of the L3 that are actually useful to us if it knew that we could fit inside the L3. And so even before we've exhausted the L3, we're starting to see some um, slowdowns. And uh, by the time we've exhausted the, the, the uh, L3 size completely, we're now just measuring RAMs, um, RAM reads. And in fact, it looks like it's even slower um, there. The 250 that we saw in the other the graph as being the plateau point for sequential reads is, is going up to more like 300 by the end of the, the working set size there. And I can only imagine that's because the RAM is now busy satisfying all of these prefetches that perhaps it shouldn't be doing. And so we're actually getting congested on access to RAM as well as, um, as, as just basically not being able to use our cache at all. So this is a great example of why you should try and make your algorithms use sequential scanning techniques instead of random pointer chasing. Although, of course, that opens up a trade-off potentially in the type of algorithms that are available to you. So yes, this is something I've pretty much gone over here that the prefetching can actually hurt us. Um, and the, a linear scan over data is more than five times better, even for relatively small data sets. Um, you can prefetch yourself. There are in 
prefetch instructions that can be emitted and there are intrinsics for C++ that allow you to emit um, these prefetch instructions which basically hint to the cache subsystem that you are going to be accessing a particular kind of memory. But it's really, really hard to get right. If you follow any of my other talks, you'll see that, that processes are hugely out of order. And so it's very difficult to predict when that prefetch instruction will actually hit the memory subsystem relative to the data um, all the instructions that need that data. So you normally have to schedule it a heck of a long way ahead so that you can guarantee that the prefetch instruction has completed and run and the data is available in the cache. And the other thing to note about the prefetch is that it overrides something called critical word load. So if you miss the cache, you are only probably reading a small subset of a cache line. Recall that a cache line atom is the is 64 bytes. That's the minimum amount we can either read from the into the cache and we can read from the RAM itself. Um, but the reads from RAM come out 64 bits at a time. So when a cache line is being read, one might reasonably think that it's read from beginning to end. So you read the first 64 bits, the next 64 bits, the next 64 bits, until you've read all the 64 bits of that 64 byte cache line, all eight sets of them. But if the processor is reading, say, the the uh, 63rd byte of that cache line, that would mean it would have to wait seven memory cycles before the data is available to the processor and it could get on with its, its work. So there's something called critical word load where the memory controller is aware that although it's fetching a particular cache line, it's going to start reading that cache line from not necessarily the beginning. It can start from like the seventh word and read seventh and then eighth and then go back to the zeroth, sorry, it will, no. the seventh would be the last one in that case if we're talking about zeroth, but it could start with the last um, 64 bits of that cache line. And then it can forward it to the processor before it's even finished reading the entire cache line. Obviously, given what we've said, um, that's the difference between like five or six memory cycles compared to all of the setup time. So it's not a huge win, but it, it might be important. And if you manually prefetch, you are only prefetching a cache line. That means that if the processor later on faults and the prefetch is already in progress, that prefetch will happen from the beginning of the line and not from the critical word that you might actually need within that line. That's a fairly technical thing to talk about, but prefetching is really, really difficult to get right. And the only kind of things where I've seen it useful is where you have um, data that is uh, chained and you're gonna do some pointer chasing in a random, random way, but before you get to the next element, you have a lot of work to do, a lot of computation to do. And then it might just be worth doing a prefetch um, so that the prefetch can be, the memory can be warm for you before you've finished doing your long lengthy calculation. But software pipelining also does that. So that effectively, if you just start reading the next um, element, if you start chasing that pointer already, then chances are the out of order system is gonna start reordering things around you so that the long calculation um, takes up re execution resources and you've already started doing the thing at the other end of the, the point to chase it, it it just comes out in a wash I, I, it's very hard to find a prefetch instruction that that is well placed um, I invite anyone to to, to um, give me a counter example I'd love to see some good well placed prefetches that work across architectures um, even within like x86 so let's have a quick look at how writes compare to reads um, as you can see, they are just more exp expensive, as you might imagine. Um, writing causes two things. One, the cache has to be brought in sometimes. If you're if you're filling a whole cache line up, the processor is sometimes smart enough to not bother bringing in what was there before to allow you to write over it. But it also requires um, an, potentially another area of the cache to be flushed. And when we were just doing reading, the cache is smart enough to know that you hadn't modified anything so that data could just be discarded from the cache and replaced with new data to cache. However, if you've written to memory, then that cache line can't be discarded because it has modified data in it. That data has to be flushed back to main memory or to the higher levels of the cache before the cache line can be reused for holding other data. So now those two things fold into why writing is more expensive than reading in this instance here. And you can see that it's, you know, of the order of twice as slow, but broadly fat follows the same patterns. And here we are doing sequential writes. Um, those don't necessarily have quite the same characteristic as write uh, as reads. Although actually now looking at this graph, they are very very similar to the the read one. They're just um, uh, 
a little slower overall. Um, so nothing particularly interesting there. Okay, we're going to move on to virtual memory now. So virtual memory, how does that fit into all of this? So we know that virtual memory is a way of saying that the address space that a particular process sees is not the physical address space of all these memory chips. So the things you've plugged into the board, the things that you're going to do, that the memory controller is going to be doing row, ac row access select and column selection and all that kind of stuff, they live in a physical address space where perhaps between 0 and 256 meg is the first RAM chip, maybe the next one's at like 2 terabytes to 6 terabytes. I, I, I really don't know how the physical layout works, and it's really unimportant, but the, the, the key thing is that it's not the same as the way that you refer to it when you're writing your programs. So how do we look up the mapping between the logical address that I'm dealing with and the actual physical address that the CPU needs to emit a read for? We have a whole bunch of hierarchical directories that tell us what to do um, for this swathe of the address space. And so here you can see the level 4, level 3, level 2, level 1 and offset there. That is actually a 64-bit address. It's not very clear. I should have put that on the slide there. But some number of the top bits are peeled away and they're used to look up inside the top level root directory. So if you'll take, for example, like we read, that those top bits are all one. So we look at the last entry in the L4 directory and the L4 directory there will say whether or not this slice, this, this pre data, uh, sorry, addresses beginning with this sequence of bits, whether that's a valid address or not. If it's not a valid address, then there's that's the end. We're going to page fault if you try to access memory there. If it is a valid address, then some bits get forwarded on along with, um, uh, sorry, no, yeah, some bits get forwarded on to the level three directory. And then we take the next few bits and use that to index into the level three directory. I, I am sorry, so the, the bits don't get forwarded. The bits are used to select which L3 directory we are going to look in. Then we take our L3 index bits and we use them to index into that particular directory. So to recap, the L4 directory is the root directory. That's like a, there's a processor register, which will say this is where you're going to be reading all your directories. Uh, you're going to start reading your directory from. The L4 index looks in the L4 directory. If there's an entry, it will tell us which L3 directory to look at. Then we look at that L3 directory and we peel off some more bits from our uh, ex our address and we use that to index the L3 and provide there's a mapping for that. We continue the process down. So now we're going to read the L2 and then the L1. And finally, the L1 will say this is where the memory actually lives. This is the physical address of the memory that is trying to be accessed. We then take the remaining bits and that will be the offset within that memory page. Now, the, as it happens, the most CPUs support different size pages so that at some points you can short circuit and say like an L3, no, 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 this is now a two gig slab of RAM. It just lives over here. Or L2, you can say this is a two meg slab of RAM, that kind of thing. But you can see that this requires four reads to go through those directories. So imagine what would happen if all, with all this caching, it's great, we, can, we don't have to read memory all that often. We can just read the cache, but we need to know what memory the process actually wanted. And so when I do mov eax comma some address, if I had to walk through all of this every time, I'd be issuing four reads just to determine which address the read for my mov instruction was for. So there's another cache, the TLBs. These are caches for this translation. And this is slightly out of date again, because this is referring to an older se se sequences of um, processes, but you can see that um, we have a multi-level cache here which turns um, logical addresses into physical addresses or slabs of logical addresses into slabs of physical addresses. So in, in this particular example of, of CPU, which I believe is the Sandy Bridge, um, the L1 has 64 4K page entries and 32 2 meg page entries. So what this means is that at any point in time, um, the address translations for 64 times 4K, which is what, 256K, are around and about and in the TLB, which means that every time a move instruction, um, a read from memory or a write to memory happens, if it's within that 256K of already um, cached in the TLB space, then the physical address is immediately available. That's great because we need that in order to determine whether or not we're looking in the right spot inside our uh, 
data caches and indeed we definitely need it if we need to go out to main memory because we need to know the actual physical address of this memory. If you've seen huge pages in Linux, um, these are these two megabyte pages. They are somewhat difficult to configure but they are worthwhile because you can effectively group two megabyte slabs of um, physical memory and index them um, using only a smaller using uh, like a dedicated six areas of the TLB and obviously that means that with the 32 2 megabyte page entries there if you're using 2 megabyte pages for your critical data we actually have 64 megabytes of space for me to read and write in to my heart's content and never miss the TLB. If we do miss the L1 TLB then there's an L2 TLB and there we've got 512 5 4k page entries which is what 2 meg of data so that's still not all that much which means that you might have more data available in your l1 l2 and l3 than you can actually find the physical addresses for using your tlbs which is a kind of mind-bending thing we don't really think about the tlb all that much now the tlbs um are flushed on context switches now this used to be wrong this slide used to have this and i actually did, removed it but Thanks to the Meltdown and Spectre bugs, this is now true again. Um, if you have got the Meltdown patches and you don't have the PCID um, feature in your CPU, then the kernel, which is um, uh, has uh, mappings, has had its mappings removed from user space, needs to re-plumb all of the uh, address tables. And in doing so, it needs to flush the TLB to make sure you can't read data you're not supposed to be able to read. And... Um, that's extremely expensive. Now, it says not needed for transition out of kernel. Again, if that's it, that's only true if um, if you haven't got the Kaiser address space um, kernel uh, isolation patch applied. If you have got the kernel isolation uh, address space isolation patch applied, then um, it is needed. But if you've got PCID, which most modern processors do, then there are other ways of, of ensuring that the TLB does need to be flushed because flushing the TLB is obviously very very expensive. Without a TLB, every memory access will take those four reads here in order to just work out the um, address in physical memory before you can even progress with reading from that physical memory. Now, those TLB entries, um, the, the page walking, I believe, is also pulled into the caches. So there are some synergies there between the various caches, but TLBs are something to be thinking about. Um, it's also worth making, noting that the TLBs are usually split for instructions and data. So there's an ITLB and a DTLB. Um, as there is indeed an L1D and an L1I um, data cache as well. So those are separate for the data and the instruction stream, but the L2 and above are, are shared. I don't know how they're shared for TLBs um, above the level one. So let's think about how that can fit in. Um, the L1 is fast and small, so we definitely, definitely, definitely want to be able to read from our L1 as soon as possible. And in this instance, what we're going to be doing is when you're um, looking in the L1, the L, the search in the L1 cache is started before the um, the results from the TLB have come in. So that means that we may find, we identify the sets that are interesting to us just using bits that do not contribute to the physical address. That's one of the reasons why the L1 is small. I mean, obviously as well as it being having to be super fast, it's, it's super convenient for us to be able to say that like bits 11 through zero don't actually factor into the physical address so we can use them inside the L1. This means that we can start reading from, uh, we can issue a read uh, to those, those sets and get them in the comparator. Then when we check the tags, we have to have waited for the TLB. So there can be a couple of um, pipeline stages going before the, um, uh, the physical tag bits are available from the translated address. So that's what it means when we say the L1 is physically tagged and virtually indexed. We use the virtual address to pick the set and the offset within the set. And then the tag comes from the physical address and that can come a little bit later on in the process. And again, you can see this is where the meltdown um, vulnerability um, sort of comes in. This is this kind of asynchronousness, asynchronousness, asynchronity between inside the chip at the L1 level. And so the DTLB is read in parallel with the cache fetch. That's kind of that there. And obviously the DTLB also, as well as having the top physical bits, will also have the permissions as to whether or not you're allowed to read that or not. And then we get meltdown if the data is read and the permissions are only checked later.
So the L2 and above are much larger and aren't so fast, as we know. So by the time we're looking in the L2, we are just using the physical address entirely. And we need more bits anyway, so we do need to have that physical address in order to choose the set within the L2 and L3. So here's a, an example of 4K sequentially read um, with small pages and with huge pages. And you can see there's not much in it for this particular workload. Um, the sequential reads for 2 meg pages are universally faster around about going on from like the log 2 of 17 upwards. And they don't have that sort of drop off around um, 18 to 23 uh, that the sequential reads do, presumably because those 4K pages, um, the, the TLB is being missed and then we're starting to see performance degradation while we're waiting for the memory system to catch up with us just reading the physical address mapping of the logical date, logical addresses we're using. Um, the uh, the sequential reads in the 2 meg pages, just we don't see that until we hit uh, 2 to the 23, which is 1 meg, if I'm remembering right. Um, oh, no, I'm not. That's that's uh, 8 meg, isn't it? So that's interesting in itself. Um, and then we start falling off the cliff. And it seems that, in general, reading from these 2 meg pages is faster than it is than um, the 4K pages, but only by a tiny bit. If you look at the scale on the left-hand side there, the difference between the, um, the sort of end game is the difference between, like, 6.3 three cycles per memory access and you know 6.4 something like that and then some more data here on huge pages here i'm i'm not even sure i can't remember what this one's all about oh this is with a bigger element size so sorry with the previous one here we were looking at 32 bytes 16 byte excuse me 16 byte elements um and with this one we're now looking at 2 to the 12 size um of elements and again Broadly flat-lined performance, um, slightly faster for the 2 meg pages, and um, in interesting sort of almost it gets faster as time time goes on. I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. That must be something to do with the interplay between the uh, the TLB and also the um, L3 at that level. I haven't really dug, dug into why that's different, but it's interesting nonetheless. So there's about yeah, 15 cycles difference there, which I don't can't explain. So our final topic is multiprocessing. So the bus between CPUs is too slow to share all the caches. And now we're talking about, at the moment, the CPUs on a single package. That's one physical chip inside your machine. So most machines will actually only have one physical chip inside of them, one CPU with maybe six or maybe 12 um, CPUs within them. But the interconnect between those is just too slow to sh share all the caches. We want to be able to make access the L1 and L2 really, really, really quick. So the TLB, the L1 and L2 are unique per core. They're all shared by the two hyperthreads on the same core, which is another topic of discussion, but we're not going to go into that right now. But they are not shared with the other real cores on the system. The L3, though, is shared by all cores on a socket, on a package, on a physical chip. So and the, and the L3 is usually sort of distributed around the space. If you ever look at a picture of one of the chips, if you see the huge regular areas um, between like um, less regular areas, that's the L3 cache. And so actually different parts of the L3 may be further away from your particular core or not. So uh, the L3 access times actually have a, 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 a an area of variability between them. It's not like a set amount of time if you miss the L3 or sorry, if you hit the L3. So how on earth if two cpus are reading and writing to the same area of memory and they have their own independent l1 and l2 how on earth can they maintain a consistent view and allow things like shared state between them well there is a chat going on between all the cpus there's a set of um a protocol called mezzi this is an extremely simplified version of the way that the cpus really talk to each other but there are many, many more states and many other clever edge transitions, but this is will give you an idea about um, how this kind of memory um, uh, coherence is is achieved. So every cache line, in addition to its tag bits, in addition to its permissions bits, and in addition to its data, has a, a set of states. It could be either modified, the M, exclusive, shared, or invalid. Obviously, invalid is easy. It means that we haven't read anything into this particular cache line yet, or it's been wiped out for, for, for some reason or other. It's been flushed. Or 
it could be modified. That's also pretty straightforward. That means that we are the only person on the, sorry, I'm gonna talk in a personal sense here. We are the only CPU that has um, this cache line loaded and it is dirty. We have changed it in some way. So we are now the authoritative source for this 64 bytes of memory. So that's the M state modified. It can be E, exclusive. That means that we know through some other mechanism that, that we are all, we ha have the one and only copy loaded into cache, but we haven't modified it yet. So nobody else has it, but we haven't changed it. That's the E, exclusive state. It can be shared. That means that it is possibly shared. It's a bit of a misnomer. We suspect that someone else may have this in their cache as well, but none of us have changed it. So it's, again, a read-only copy of data that is unmodified and may be shared with other chips. And then the invalid we've already talked about. Here are all the possible transitions that can happen between these various states. And it's far too mind-bending to go into detail right now, but we'll talk about some of the transitions. So going from the invalid state to the exclusive or shared, which means that somebody else has said they'd read um, the uh, either we've read it or someone else has said that they've read it um, on the bus saying, hey, I read this memory location. I've got it now. Those are those are somewhat expensive, right? I mean, especially if you're fetching the data yourself, then you have to wait for it to come into your cache. That's And then you mark it as being either exclusive. I've got the only copy or shared. Hey, I've got this, but I think someone else has got it too. It's almost free to go from the exclusive to modified. So if you know that you have the only copy of this information in your cache right now, and then you write to it, that is you modify it, then all you need to do is change the bit that says it's exclusive to, <coughs> excuse me, to it's now modified and exclusive. It's really pretty expensive to go from the invalid to the modified state. That means you didn't have it before to now you've got it, it's exclusive, it's the only copy in the system and you've modified it or from the S state, the um, shared state, to the modified state. The reason for this is you have to tell all the other CPUs that you're about to steal something that they might have. <coughs> Excuse me. So for example, if you're in a shared state, you know or suspect that someone else also has this in their cache. And so before you can modify it, you have to make sure that everyone else has moved their shared data into the uh, invalid state or thrown it away. They have to throw away their copies because you're about to change it and you're going to be the authoritative source. This is called a request for ownership. So a request for ownership is, um, I'm about to modify something that I think you might have, so you must flush it um, and, uh, and I have to wait until you've done that and then I potentially even have to reread it because potentially you, you, um, you had a modified copy too. Um, actually, no, that's not true. If you're in a shared state, you know that nobody else has modified it, so you can go straight to um, the modified state. If you're in an invalid state, i.e. you haven't got this at all, you have to do an RFO to say, look, maybe someone else has this. You have to flush it, and then I have to read it from you. So if someone else has got a modified copy of the cache line you're interested in, you need to let them flush it, then you need to get a copy of it, and then you can say that now it's mine. So those are why that's expensive. So the minimum transaction for this obviously is one entire cache line. So if you have two threads that are um, sharing data, um, then um, obviously you're, you're, you have to have this RFO. If they're, if they're modifying a piece of state between the two of them, then as you read it, you need to say, hey, has anyone else got this? I need a an up-to-date copy of it. Um, or um, if you're modifying, you just say, hey, make sure you haven't got a copy of this. I'm about to change it. And that's an expensive um, conversation between two CPUs. But if you're not sharing data, at least not on purpose, make sure that any data that you, one thread is using is at least 64 bytes away from data that another thread might be using. Now, if you're just reading it, it's not such an important thing. You can definitely share as much data in a read-only fashion as nobody needs to request ownership. But if you're modifying, if you've got two threads running, for example, one has an integer that's incrementing and another one that has an integer that's incrementing, and they're independent as far as your mindset and thought processes go, if those two integers that are being incremented are in the same cache line, 
then those two CPUs will be fighting each other forevermore to own that cache line. Thread 1 will execute the increment and it says, I need to get hold of this. But it knows that it hasn't got that cache line at the moment exclusively because it knows that someone else has modified it. It's in the invalid state. So it has to issue a request for ownership from the other CPU. The other CPU has to flush it to RAM, switches back to you. You increment the number. And of course, then the other thread says, well, I want to increment it now. And it ping pongs backwards and forwards between the two cache uh, between the two CPUs and, and that's an expensive operation and it can be hugely um, uh, devastating to your performance if you are unaware. So if you have multiple threads accessing shared data in a you know, read-write fashion, make sure that those data structures are at least 64 bytes or at least in different cache lines from each other if you don't need to actually share them. Let's talk a little bit about um, multi-chip solutions. So when you have more than one physical CPU, so the picture at the bottom left there um, has four physical CPUs. Each of those would have maybe 16 or, 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 or so like CPUs within it. Sorry, let me explain it again. Those CPUs are physical packages of processors and each package has multiple CPU cores inside of it. So most high-end machines are set up this way. So most servers that you're, if you're, if you're used to using servers or very, very high-end desktop machines will have maybe two physical CPUs and therefore, you know, 32 processors in total. Be aware that the conversations between those CPUs um, are expensive and that the RAM is plugged directly into those CPUs. If you recall, we used to have a North Bridge, which the RAM fell off of. Um, nowadays, the North Bridge, the memory controller, is in the physical package of the CPU, which means that the RAM has to be plugged into one of the CPUs. Or in the case of the example of the bottom right-hand corner, bottom left-hand corner, we've got four CPUs, each of which has its own local RAM. Now, that RAM forms the RAM of your computer, and the RAM can be routed between CPUs. So um, if you need to access the RAM on plugged into CPU2 from CPU1, that can be achieved, but it's slower. Now, Linux by default will stripe RAM between um, all of the different NUMA. Sorry, NUMA stands for non-uniform memory architecture. And here we actually have that, you know, like the, the RAM is not uniform. You cannot uniformly access memory around the system. It's, it depends on where it's plugged in and where you are running. Um, so Linux will stripe this to try and make effective use of the RAM across the whole machine, but it may not be what you want. If you've got a very, very fast process that is churning through RAM, you might want to say only allocate RAM memory on this CPU, on these CPUs, um, from the RAM that is physically plugged into those CPUs or by the, the bus attached to it. So definitely measure it. There's a pro, um, uh, command LS topo, which will show you the to, to, uh, topology of your system and you can sort of see how everything fits together and you can see that whether RAM is there or not. Also worth noting that things like network cards are plugged into PCI buses that themselves are part of the, um, usually part of the uh, um, the fast path for the RAM. I know I've drawn it there on the South Bridge. I'm, I'm less sure about that now, but I've definitely experienced cases where network cards plugged into one socket go to one CPU and um, plug into a different socket, go to the other CPU in a multi-CPU system. And so it's important to allocate memory and bind your processes if you really care about performance to the correct physical CPU nodes so that they are adjacent to the memory and the peripherals that they're using. So in summary, this has turned, turned out to be a quite a long talk and I apologize for not breaking it into smaller pieces, but let's go over what, um, what we can do. So the first thing we want to do is make sure we can make effective use of that cache. We should know how big the cache lines are so that we know that keeping data small means that, that we're using fewer cache lines and fewer, less amounts of the cache. We know that L1, L2, and L3 uh, have different sizes and have different uh, characteristics. We know that there's a prefetcher which can help us if we're doing linear scans or near as, near as have it, uh, linear scans and we can we know that the, the prefetcher can actually hurt us in some cases because um, if we're doing genuine random movement then um, it can be taking up some of our memory bandwidth so it's just another reason to avoid po pointer chasing prefetching is is possible but it's very tricky to get right um, we didn't talk about this but it is possible to bypass the cache completely um, when appropriate 
Now, when that is appropriate is, is very difficult to know for certain, but if you're going to be copying an awful lot of data from one area to another, then you can use instructions that don't actually allocate cache memory. They just do store directly to memory. You have to be very, very careful because um, the usual rules of x86 memory coherency go out the window and you must, you're responsible for doing the right amount of, of, of fences, but you effectively could do, say, a mem copy without flooding your cache with data you don't care about. So if you're going to copy a ton of memory from one area to another and then not look at it straight away, or it's much more than the cache, you could use a non-cache polluting store to store that memory out without allocating tons of, um, uh, sorry, that wouldn't be a mem copy, it's mem set, say. Um, you can use a non-cache polluting store to make sure that like you aren't bringing all of this data you're not going to use straight away into the cache. But again, it's very difficult to get right and it's very specialist, but be aware that it exists. And so now we make the last slide. Um, I've got a questions thing there because this is the the presentation I gave at work, and this is when um, people gave asked me questions. Uh, my email address is there, and my Twitter handle is there. Um, a lot of the RAM stuff towards the beginning was based on um, heavily on what every programmer should know about memory by Ulrich Grepper, and I recommend you read this. It's an excellent um, article. It's um, even older than this presentation by some margin, but it's still very very relevant. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or email me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. And if you have, please like and subscribe to my channel. I hope to do more of these. Thank you.